from Title On Air. Welcome to I'm in the Band. I'm your host, Allison Wolf. I can see what you're going to say to me if I don't explain it away. I'm in the band and I deserve to be here and I do anyway. I got a great band for you this time. Screaming Females. Marissa Paternoster, Jarrett Doherty, and Michael Abate are all from Jersey, and they just put out their seventh studio album. I first heard about Screaming Females when I was living in New York. I went and saw them open for Ted Leo in 2009, and I was blown away by the front woman, Marissa. My name is Marissa Paternoster. I play guitar and I sing in the band Screaming Females. And it's how she sings and plays guitar that struck me. Fucking fierce. She's intense for someone who's kind of... I'm small. No, I'm small. It's cool. (laughs) I wanted to hear about Marissa's musical background, her comic drawings, and her coming out story. We'll get to that later. But first, I asked about the time she went to an insane clown posse protest in Washington, D.C. Oh, about the Juggalo rally? Yeah. Okay. Um, In the year 2017, (laughs) the great subculture called the Juggalos, fans of the insane clown posse congregated in front of the Lincoln Memorial to protest their place on the FBI's registered gang list. When you see another juggalo, you say whoop whoop, and then they say whoop whoop back, and it feels really good. Whoop whoop! Whoop whoop! There we go. People of America, the juggalos are not a gang. They merely enjoy the musical stylings of the insane clown posse, which is some fear-mongering, rape fantasy garbage music. (laughs) I actually, I don't, I don't really feel that passionately about the cause. I just wanted to go look at the outfits. So what did you see or what did you experience? Oh, I saw so many nice outfits. People obviously donning juggalo face paint and looking fantastic. I saw a man who I don't think identified as a juggalo, but had found like his people just doing whippets for like four and a half hours in front of the reflecting pool, which I felt like was a really nice picture. Whoop, whoop. I don't know. I You need to have like more of a guttural <laughs> kind of thing. But it's it's nice. Uh, um, can you just start by telling me where you grew up? Mike and I grew up in a city in North Jersey called Elizabeth. And Jared grew up in a city in North Jersey called Montclair. I met Mike when we were kids and we went to school together for pretty much our entire lives. He was like two years younger than me. And we didn't have classes together or anything, but I'd always kind of follow him around in the hallways because he had long hair and, like, punk patches and stuff. And then we started eating lunch together. (laughs) Then we became friends. And did you start the band back in high school? or? When I graduated from high school, the summer before I went to college, Mike and I started a band with, like, some neighborhood kids. Uh, We were called Surgery on TV. I definitely learned a lot about, like, writing songs and and playing shows even though it was only a six month long like seven month long stint (laughs) we weren't long for this world we were kind of a jam band because our keyboard player really liked Medeski Martin and Wood so can you tell me a little bit about how like your parents and how you grew up and what kind of kid you were I'm an only child my mother and my father are both teachers and they both taught in the public school system in Elizabeth My dad was the one who got me interested in rock and roll, and my mom was the one who got me interested in, like, painting and drawing. So I was, like, very much a recluse. The stuff I like to do just didn't involve other people. I don't think I was, like, a particularly unhappy child until I started to understand that, like, other people thought that I was weird and, like, I was supposed to be outside with other kids. Like, I didn't know that was something I ought to be doing because I liked drawing so much. Like, I always loved just sitting and drawing. I love cartoons and comic books and like Mad Magazine and stuff like that. I don't think I really like noticed 
that I w was different until I probably started getting made fun of, and I'm sure it was really easy to make fun of in retrospect. I had a really difficult time with really particular things like clothing. I had no idea that I was gay up until I was probably older than a lot of other people. I wanted to like assimilate and I wanted to be desired and stuff and just like couldn't comprehend why I was unable to but like as early as like preschool I remember like my grandmother bought me a dress and you know I'm barely sentient I was like basically an amoeba version of a human and I just had like a complete meltdown because I couldn't have it like on my body and she like was totally befuddled and couldn't understand and I'm sure I couldn't either because I was four but then that anxiety traveled with me up until I was older and then through the lens of other preteens, I was very queer presenting. Like, I was a tomboy. I only hung out with mostly other young dudes, <laughs> read comic books. I was into Star Wars. Like, I was just not cool. I wasn't wholly rejected by the people I went to school with because everybody was just like, Marissa's good at drawing. She's into weird stuff. It's okay. But there were some older kids who, like, drove me pretty much to the brink of insanity, and that's why I, I wound up changing from public school to a very affordable, like, Catholic school, which is also weird because my mother is culturally Jewish. <laughs> For all of the problematic things that you can only assume a queer young person would find in Catholic school, I felt very safe there and nobody bothered me, which is all I wanted. I just wanted to be left alone. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but what were some of the things that these older kids did to you or said to you? Um, pretty what? much just like basic bully shit. Just throwing stuff at me, you know, where I grew up. Like everyone lives near each other. So if I walk to the corner store and I put my bike outside and those kids came by and saw my bike, it would get like thrown in the street. I remember one time I was walking home with some kid and he asked me if I was a dyke and I didn't know what that meant. But I did know that it had something to do with water. <laughs> and so I was really confused. So I had to ask him. And then I was like, oh my God, that would make a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> it was a lot like a teen drama. Like an after school special. Yeah, you know. Then around like seventh grade, my anxiety levels about like going outside or going to school were just peaked all the time. I was like a basket case. Also, I was probably like acutely insane because I was a teenager. <laughs> childhood that was like pretty rife with conflict. My mom was ill for like most of my life. My personal needs and wants had to kind of like take a back burner to all that stuff. So I think I just kind of put all that stuff in the back of my mind and was like, I'll just deal with it later when I have more of an emotional capacity to deal with it. Mother knows best, then mother knows why. How old were you when you fully embraced it or recognized it and also came out and do you have a coming out story? I definitely like identified as punk and like a feminist way before I was ever like galvanized into like any kind of queer identity. I just felt like there were already so many other things I had to deal with. The last thing in the world I wanted was to also be gay. There were moments like when I was like 14 or younger where I was just like well hopefully I'll die so I don't have to deal with this because it sucks when you're a kid and you now I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. This is my preferred way of being. <laughs> I, I met my first girlfriend when I was like 19 or something. So I think that's when I was just like, okay, this is something I'm going to have to start dealing with as an adult or a young adult or whatever. And then I told my dad when I was like 20. And I mean, of course, both my parents were very aware. <laughs> they were like, yeah, cool. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, okay. I was eating an Oreo and crying because <laughs> I was terrified. You ever eat an Oreo and cry? No, I'm usually pretty happy when I'm eating an Oreo. You would think that, right? <laughs> and it's gross because like the, the, the cookie gets stuck in your teeth the way an Oreo does. And then you're crying was like making snots and tears and stuff. And it's just like, 
a really gross combo. Did you ever have issues with who to be out to, you know, besides your family, like out in the world or in, in music later or in school or whatever? Well, in music, it's never been an issue. Thankfully, I was very comfortable with talking about it. And even in instances where I wasn't, I think I can recognize that, like, it's important to be out. But in school, I kind of, like, came out, like, right before college. And while I was dating my first girlfriend, I was in the closet the whole time. And it's, you know, it's a horrible feeling. That constant weight of anxiety that I was talking about in middle school just kind of repurposed itself. So just, like, any time you do anything together, you can't even enjoy spending time with the other person because you're so fucking stressed out. Uh, there was no romance in my life <laughs> before I was an 18-year-old grown person. I was, like, way too busy drawing Ren and Stimpy and listening to, like, Bratmobile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also gathered that you're really into comic books and drawing and stuff like that. Well, I guess you said, said as much. What are some of your favorite comics or what do you think about the world of comics? And do you go to Comic-Cons and stuff like that or what? No, I mean, my knowledge of comics is like pretty crappy now. Now, now like every pre-millennial or millennial identified person, I'm like, I don't read comics, I read graphic novels. So like you're really like, you know, Alison Bechdel. And Why do you like hers? I think Alison Bechtel is really cool because um, not only are they like a great draftsman, but like a terrific writer. And I think it's hard to find somebody who does both exceedingly well. Also just being like smart as a whip. And also just like kind of just being ahead of the game. Like Dykes to Watch Out For was a crazy comic strip way before its time. Like so smart, so like engaging, so well done. It blows my mind that somebody had the capacity to make something so radical before, like, there was really maybe an audience for it. I don't know. What were some of your early musical influences, and how did you get into playing music? The first music I, like, sat down and listened to on purpose was probably, like, TLC. And then... Which era or which album? Oh, Crazy Sexy Cool. I had it on cassette. But I also like grunge, like Nirvana and, and Pearl Jam and all that stuff. And, I mean, Nirvana is, like, a pretty obvious band to like when you're like a angry teen or whatever but then I started getting into like kill rock stars and and chainsaw and stuff like that and that's when like I really started identifying as a punk And did you play in like high school band or anything like that? Or how did you start thinking that you actually wanted to pick up an instrument or sing or? Um, I was in choir when I was still in public school, but my dad, he likes to like play open chords on guitar or whatever, you know, like I think I was listening to like probably Nirvana and he was like, I can show you how to play this. It's really easy. And then he did. And I just like kept doing it for, I, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't remember having any like epiphany or being like, yeah, I love doing this. I was just like, this is what I do now. I mean, it's a guitar. <laughs> what made you kind of think that you could be in a band? For a long time, I was like, just forget it. I don't, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to like enjoy playing by myself. But then once Slither Kenny presented itself to me, I was like, holy shit. They are all the things that I am and I can maybe do this and so I felt like it was within my grasp then I got like obsessed with the idea of it and I thought if I couldn't be in a band that I would just die I'm also thinking about the um, Jersey music scene and and in, in general I know I'm generalizing but Everyone I know who's from Jersey has extreme Jersey pride. And yeah. there's something to it. <laughs> there's something to it to these kind of like tough, creative people from there. Also, bands I've been in, like Party Line, we used to play the Jersey house party basement scene a lot and warehouses and whatever. 
it was always just such a kind of wild experience and fun. And we'd be drinking sparks. And, <laughs> and then we'd go to the grease trucks after oh, pig out with like fries <laughs> in your falafel or whatever. Um, so, yeah, could you describe the kind of Jersey punk scene that you came up in? And Yeah, I mean, I think like when you are trying to make art or music or whatever, create some kind of like community space for arts and culture in New Jersey, you kind of have to like fight against whatever the prevailing trend is. And the prevailing trend is always going to be stuff happens in New York, it doesn't happen in New Jersey, or stuff happens in Philadelphia, it doesn't happen in New Jersey. But starting to play shows in New Brunswick, it's like, I'm not going to go to New York every day or every other day for a show. It costs like $25. And like, there's no reason why the people of of New Jersey can't enjoy a a friendly punk show. (laughs) So Right now, the climate for shows in New Jersey is pretty bad. There's, you know, Maxwell's is closed. Asbury Lanes is gone. Monty Hall is beneath WFMU, and uh, they can do all ages shows, but there really aren't a lot of spaces for people to congregate and talk to each other and enjoy art or music together, and that's, like, it's really a shame because <laughs> New Jersey is, like, the most densely populated state in the country. And and where do you live now? I live in Philly. Oh, okay. How yeah. long have you been living there? I think like three years, maybe. Why did you move to Philly and what's the scene there? What's going on there? I moved to Philly because um, New Jersey is really, really expensive, which a lot of people don't know. And I obviously don't make a lot of money. (laughs) And so I found a very affordable room and it's improved my quality of life because now I can like buy like more food than less food and like I can like pay all my own bills you know and that's cool (laughs) uh and uh the music scene there I I I feel like I would be really hesitant to describe it to you because I don't really like I'm back to being a recluse (laughs) I see a lot of New Jersey people and like people I've met through punk who live in Philly because it's just an affordable place to live Maybe you can talk a little bit about your songwriting process. Well, yeah, I mean, you're really fronting. The, you're kind of doing the whole thing, the melody, the lyrics, all that. Yeah. Um, well, Jack, Mike and Jared and I write all the music together. It, it's pretty rare that I would bring in a song that like I wrote uh, from top to bottom. Uh, it's pretty. It's happened like once or twice or something. And then even even in those instances, like we still arrange it together and a lot can change. I think it's kind of crazy if like you have a drummer who writes their drum part but they're not credited as being a songwriter. I agree. It's so strange to me. But uh, we never really discussed that stuff. We always wanted to be like a band. Like, you know, we're, we're more than like any individual together. And so, yeah, I mean, I just write the lyrics because I'm the one singing, and that just seems appropriate. My fingers swam a gun As blinding as the sun But I'm about to point it to the rock So it seems like you guys are a band that tours a lot. I was wondering if you have any crazy tour stories or if you could just talk about touring. Um, our first tour, our first national tour was 70 days long because we didn't know how long they were supposed to be. That seemed right. (laughs) So it was crazy. I think that first tour really kind of like set the stage where we met other people who are our age who are just like getting in the car and traveling the country and sleeping on people's floors who are still remain our friends to this day and like it's kind of like a working musician's livelihood especially since you're not really selling records anymore I do wonder why it became so much a part of our identity just because we never expected it to be our job it just seemed like what we ought to be doing is playing shows because that's like what else would you do if you're in a band has anything um if you can think of any like kind of wild times on tour or, or weird or hard things or. I feel like a lot of early tour stories just involve like gross bodily fluids where it's just like somebody stepped in poop or someone like puked on me or like someone spilled pea soup all over my amp or like, you know, the cat pissed on Jarrett. I feel like we come into contact with other creatures just like 
poop and pee really often. I don't know if that's like signature for our band or something. Gosh, I, you know, we've been in a lot of like very close call kind of like car accidents that were like pretty terrifying. <laughs> it, and if you have any other stories of things that people have come up and said to you that meant a lot. I mean, I think that we have like some of the most kind, sweet little angels who come and see us play. Uh, I am told things that flatter me beyond belief all the time. A lot of people who are like struggling with like their queer identity, who really like listening to screaming pe- females, a lot of people with chronic pain who like listening to screaming females. It re- it really runs the the gamut, and I'm I'm really happy that we have like a a relatively eclectic fan base. It's cool. Speaking of chronic pain, I think I heard somewhere that you might be experiencing that or have experienced it and I don't know if you want to talk about it or not but if you do do you want to talk about what what happened or what's going on there's not really much of a story to it um there was a national tour where I got mono probably from a microphone because I certainly wasn't smooching anybody I was older I was 27 most people get it when they're in their early 20s or late teens or whatever and I just had it forever I had it for over a year one of those national tours was with garbage I felt a lot of pressure to finish that tour, and I wanted to, you know. Garbage was a very important band to me as a child, and they were all very, like, sweet and caring, conscientious people, and it was, I felt very safe being around them, especially in the vulnerable state that I was in. It's like, have you had mono? No. It sounds dumb because it's something that so many people get, but it sucks. It's like just having the flu really bad, forever (laughs) and so I maybe because like the frequency in which we were traveling or it very well could just be like a weird manifestation of mental illness I really don't know but like I kept testing positive for being acutely infected and then ever since I've gotten well I've had something called fibromyalgia which is like affects primarily women especially women who are experiencing mental illness um it there's no way to test for it there's no even scientific or concrete proof that it exists, but so many people, uh, their lives are like controlled by it. I think it's kind of hard to deny. So they just kind of gave it like this name and it's called fibromyalgia. I, I really went through a lot of different doctors trying to figure out what it was because I was just like, I don't know, everything hurts. Like some, there has to be something wrong. Like I got a bunch of MRIs at one point. I still had health insurance. So I had like seven different doctors and they were like, you need to go to a psychiatrist. Like, there's nothing wrong with you physically. And so I have a lot of other friends who suffer from fibromyalgia. Um, I know a lot of my friends' mothers have fibromyalgia. How do you treat it or what do you do? That's the thing. It's like it's different for everybody because there's just no, there's no way to test for it. There's no cause. It's kind of just a matter of semantics. It's like this at least this is my personal opinion. I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me and that's fine. But it's kind of just like a word to represent this all over chronic pain. So you you can do a lot of things. A lot of people take SSRIs. I'm sure that a lot of people take muscle relaxants and stuff. I don't. (laughs) And I've I've been on antidepressants for most of my adult life. So I fell ill with mono in the like four year respite that I wasn't on antidepressants. And once I went back on them, I started feeling better. But for a while, I was just like, oh, I'm actually losing my mind. (laughs) It was hurt really badly. I was sleeping for like two hours a night or something like that uh, for like, you know, over a month. So it was a weird time in my life, for sure. Have you ever faced any kind of, I don't know, discrimination or things like that in your kind of touring or band life? And if you could tell any stories about that or maybe just out in other parts of your life. In New Brunswick, I feel like there was a really good um, 
group of like just strong female identified people who are playing music and since there were so few people who are actively playing music I don't know it just like never was discussed like as frequently as it is in mainstream music journalism where like a woman playing guitar is kind of looked at or any instrument as like an anomaly and I didn't really start having discussions about it until I started being interviewed they'd just be like, what is it like being a female guitarist? And I'm just like, I can't really speak on behalf of anyone else's reality. Like, I only know what it's like to be like a female identified person and play the guitar. It's pretty cool. (laughs) I've been really lucky to not like have endured much discrimination uh, at shows. I think, you know, people come up to me and tell me that I'm like good at guitar and they've never seen a woman play guitar like that, and it's, you know, it's like, I could get angry, I suppose, but also there's a good chance that that's just their truth, and, like, I'd rather have them at a Screaming Female show than at, like, a slap shot show, (laughs) (laughs) and I also don't want to, like, pontificate or lecture anybody, because, like, that's not my place in the world, and it's not, like, somewhere I want to be. I don't want to police people I don't want to tell them like how to think or feel um I can only just kind of like present them with like my my art and be like if you like it then thank you I'm very humbled by your appreciation like I don't really know maybe that's foolish so the name of this podcast is called I'm in the band first track man (laughs) yeah I have that album (laughs) not an idiot so the idea (laughs) of that song or behind it was that and this still happens to me, like if I'm playing, like often the security or whoever's working the club, they don't, when you walk in early, they're trying to kick you out and they're like, wait, the show's not starting yet. Doors aren't open yet. Um, what are you doing here? Do you ever get any of that? No. Good. To be totally honest, I don't. And I, I have a lot of friends who do. Um, maybe there's something about my resting face and the way I walk into places where they're just like they're supposed to be here like I don't know I am I either invisible or terrifying I have no idea but it's one of those two things good yeah it sounds it's like great. some progress is getting made I think that you did it <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any do I you ever do karaoke I only do paradise for the dashboard like oh, by meatloaf right. we talked about doing it maybe Ooh. my mom taught me the buster brown theme song he sold shoes, I believe. Do you want to sing a little bit of Paradise? Wait, but what's the like the main chorus? Isn't like, that I want to know that. right now? Do you love me? Do you love me forever? Do you need me? Will you never leave me? Will you- so that's your go-to karaoke song. It's the only one I've ever done. <laughs> awesome! <laughs> wow. Marissa, so great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on your podcasts. Yeah. I'm in the Band is brought to you by Title On Air and is produced by me, Allison Wolf, And me, Jonathan Shiflett. You can find our podcast by going to title.com slash US slash on air. Or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RealBabyDonut. Bye. It still hurts.